Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 789. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 14th, 2023. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. Happy Valentine's Day. This is a, certainly a, a wonderful day that you should be spending with your significant other, not just watching Kevin and George. In fact, if it's seven at night, you need to be at a restaurant or in front of a meal that you prepared for your significant other, not watching George and Kevin. However, at eight, nine, 10, 11, you're welcome to turn us on. We are appreciative of that. You know but how Kevin, you today's yeah. It, today's the feast day of Cyril and Methodius. Is it there is something too. else on the calendar? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, gross. But it's also a day of likes. If you want to show Kevin and George how much you like us and love us and send us your Valentine's, click the like button. We appreciate that very much. I do want to mention the comment section on our YouTube page uh, for each video. There's a comment section. You click on the video, you look and you scroll down and you say, oh my gosh, people are talking. You could be one of those people. We've had you know hundreds of comments over the last couple of shows, especially dealing with the, the Church of England uh, Synod that happened the other week. So we appreciate if you would add your voice to that as well. George, how you doing? I'm excited. Kevin, we've had one of the best weeks, months for Anglican Inc. in a long, long time. Yes. <laughs> and the year is perking up. Uh, Next week, I think I've got something from a Pancake Dinner run by the Sunday School on Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, uh, a healing cla uh, a prayer seminar on Saturday, uh, Stations of the Cross on Friday. I got something every day next week, and uh, the season's really kicking off. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I get the stats from Google, and Google says we had 90,000 visits this week to read your, your stories about what happened last week in Synod. We've also, Google said, people have gone to Google and searched Anglican.inc 30,000 times. Well, you don't need to search it. You just put that in, in your, your your tab of the browser. That's not a, a term. You just put that in, that is the address. You don't have to search that, but, well, you know, whatever. Well, are there 30,000 lawyers looking now to say <laughs> yeah, what's <laughs> oh, No. But, it has been I, quite I, a week, yeah. I, but I have had uh, something personally very exciting for me. I was, I've was i been accepted into a continuing education course, uh, but this one is in Rome in Italy, and I'll be going later this spring to the, I have to write down uh, the name, the Teno Pontifico Regina Apostolorum, Apostolicorum. They've got a course on the Ministry of Deliverance and Exorcism, and they've opened it up to Protestants, uh, formerly for lay... Uh, it had been for Catholic clergy only, mm -hmm. but I think they're realizing uh, they're taking Christ's words to heart that if you're not against us, you're for us. Sure. So they've now are welcoming non-Catholic clergy into the clergy training program there. Oh, so I, I'm excited. I'm honored. I just now have to find the money to get there. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, that's always the difficulty. Uh, now, this isn't at the same time as GAFCON 4. No, no, no. Okay, no. Okay, this is this is later in the year. I think May. Okay, just checking. All right. First story: five sub points, thirteen sub sub points. Synod feedback, and then we're talking about the Church of England's synod from last week, where they um, recommended the uh, LLF, which is the Living Love and Faith, same sex blessings for. Um, marriages and civil unions. And this was uh, something taken on by the bishops uh, in an extraordinary fashion. And now we're having the response to that. And we had a response, initial response the first week. This is kind of the longer term response that wasn't published then. And we are hearing from Archbishop of Canterbury, retired Lord Carey. What's he got to say, George? George Carey had a letter to the Times, which is the uh, establishment way of making your point known. Uh, not every letter, far from it, is published in the Times. But they published George Carey saying that General Synod's decision is unbiblical, unscriptural, and just wrong. 
So George Carey has sounded uh, the concern of a senior, some may respect, many respect him, most respect him, some dislike him intensely. But uh, George Carey's weighing in on this is quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary indeed. It and, is. Uh, now, some of the criticism I saw, well, why didn't you speak up sooner? Yeah, that's kind of the, some of the stuff I saw on Twitter and Facebook. It's not his. He's yeah. retired, Kevin. I mean, <laughs> we there, there are the certain retirees who just continually never shut up, and nobody pays any attention to them. Yeah. But then there are those who sort of uh, husband their powder and uh, shoot their bullet at the right time to make the point. If he had spoken before the meeting, he would basically have become part of the process and the problem and been vilified. If he speaks mm -hmm. after the fact and gives his opinion as an elder, that has far more weight and far more influence. And, you know, to be fair, George Carey's reputation is fairly high in the Anglican communion, whereas he was a pilloried by the Guardian from stop to start to finish, so most liberal thinkers in England dislike it. Yeah, he was he was before my time, but I do remember there being a lot of uh, uh, British press attacks on him. Also, the Church Society has given a response. Another one. Church Society has their whole spectrum of responses. Essentially, everything's uniformly negative, by the way. There's nobody except the bishops' letter. The bishops are starting to write letters to their dioceses, Oxford, Leicester, Norwich, all saying how wonderful this is and how we could all be. Uh, my, it reminds me of that 70s commercial, I'd like to teach the world to sing oh, for Coca-Cola, Coca the people on the mountainside. Well, the Bishop of Oxford is singing from that song sheet. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony when gays and conservatives can love each other and all give money to the Church of England. Um, apart from the bishops, nobody's singing that hymn. The uh, Church Society has one strategy, which is the battle's not over. That the, uh, bat the Church Society, and I'm boiling this down way past the point they would like it, but the Church Society is saying we need to pick the battlefield on which we wish, wish to fight because General Synod is a field of battle where we will lose because we don't have the numbers and we don't have we don't control the, the chair the way Justin Welby does and the bishops do. So we need to fight on a plane where we will win, and that is in theology and scriptural study and in the courts, the ecclesial courts, because we can win knockout victories on all three points. So the church society is saying it's not over. Now, they're being attacked from the right by saying it is over, get out, join the Anglican network in Europe, join GAFCON, whatever it is, where you jump, just get your chute ready to bail out because the plane's going down. Um, other people are telling us, uh, you know, they're going to stay, pray and not pay. This is All Souls Langham Place, the famous church made famous by John Stott. Mm -hmm. This is uh, St. Helen's Bishop's Gate, the uh, uh, mega ch uh, influential church in the city of London. Some smaller churches from York all the way out to the West and Cornwall have all sort of started down this path of we're going to stay, we're going to pray, but we're not going to pay and we're going to differentiate ourselves. That's the Church of England Evangelical Council approach. People are starting to put those into motion. But it takes time to get, you know, lay people together to hold parochial councils and explain what's going on and the implications of everything. We've also had feedback about our coverage of Synod. Some people have pointed out gaps, and we thank them for this yeah. information. One thing that we did not mention was that in all the amendments brought, at least five times, the bishops called for a vote by orders. In synod, the votes usually uh, yay or nay by, you know, voice vote or hands or whatever, where everybody votes together. But there is a mechanism where somebody can call for a vote by the bishops, by the clergy, by the laity, and to pass, it must pass all three. Five amendments to weaken and strengthen, uh, weaken the Sam Margrave amendments, and strengthen the Jan Ozano amendment were defeated where the bishops voted by orders. So the bishops basically controlled, uh, if they stood together as a block, they prevented any changes to what they were preparing 
for synod to do. So if there's a villain in this piece, it's the bishops of the Church of England. And what we're hearing, what we're hearing is third hand. Concerned clergy talking to their bishops who may be friendly to them and the bishops then responding and those concerned clergy then tell us what was said. And it's essentially on the line that uh, Adolf Eichmann gave at Nuremberg. I was just following orders. I was just scheduling the trains to go to Auschwitz. I did not drop the Zyklon B pellet into the chamber. This is what the Archbishop of Canterbury wants. Justin Welby is so very emotionally fragile right now. Things are so on tenterhooks. We just need to find the safe way forward. So we're holding our nose and letting this go through in hopes that it'll blow up down the road. I, well, by my, with the analogy I chose, you know what I think about that analogy. Well, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. The goal of the Archbishop of Canterbury was to keep the peace. I'm going to keep the communion together. I'm going to keep the Church of England together. I'm going to make sure that the Episcopal Church doesn't get kicked out and Canada doesn't get kicked out. My role, according to uh, Archbishop Justin Welby, is to keep that peace and keep that via media within the via media. And it didn't work. But here we are watching the Church of England's General Synod, and nobody's happy. Nobody won. Nobody uh, can claim a victory, uh, and especially the Church of England, especially the gospel, especially the witness of the Church of England. It, it, that's gone. And it's gone and, on a local level, and it's gone on an international level in one little swoop. Oof. And it's gone on a personal level. And that the only bishop, serving bishop, to speak out, George Carey has spoken out from the conservative side. Uh, Keith Sinclair, the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council, has spoken out, but he's retired. Mm -hmm. The only serving bishop to speak forcefully in public, in, the, in interviews, has been the Bishop of Lancaster, Jill Duff. Now let's just pause for a second for all the people who get all excited about women bishops. The only faithful bishop that the, the parishioners, the church communion can see is a woman bishop. That's the only one standing for truth of scripture and the integrity of the gospel witness and tradition. And, you know, it's almost like, whoa, <laughs> what a crazy <laughs> world we're in. That, that is pretty crazy. <laughs> and, but because, you know, none of the other conservatives, the society, the Anglo-Catholic group, they might as well not it exist anymore. Mm -hmm. They've just abdicated. Um, they may say to their supporters, here's where we were, but we we're playing a close game because, you know, this and that. Uh, some other comments that we got back was that uh, we were rather harsh on the Corns Amendment. Which was one, which was the only amendment that was put forward that passed, and one of the people involved with that said that we weren't fair because the implication of what we were saying is that the evangelicals who adopted that were sellouts. I did not say that. We did not say that. But I think that's what they're hearing from other people, and our analyses support that conclusion. So I guess it's fair to make that charge against us. The the Corns Amendment was designed to make something that was going to pass palatable, at least to be able to come away with something that can buy us more time to fight the good fight on a different battlefield. The evangelicals who backed the Corns Amendment were always going to vote against the whole package. But the Margrave approach, Sam Margrave's amendments, which they all agreed with in principle, would just alienate those middle muddle English on the th on the fence and so for political reasons and some of them included martin snow the bishop of leicester were more publicly against their ally sam margrave because he was not following their political strategy than they were against the bigger issue so part of the difficulty is when you're an outsider looking in, you don't see all the waves, you don't see all the ins and outs, you don't see uh, the, uns the, the backroom conversations, you only see the public face, and you have the mess that arose. 
Well, you had the, well, the church of uh, uh, the, the first. Well, we saw the you know offhanded and in the back rooms of the the synod was the character assassination. Yeah, you know, they wanted to make sure they killed the messenger. Here's Sam mm -hmm. Margrave. He is a horrible, mean person because uh, he tweets like Trump. And then we see the character assassinations of all the other, not just individuals, but groups. And they wanted to be sure they had the ad hominem shoot the messenger so that when the message came up, even if the message is correct, it wouldn't have that much support because it was attached, guilty by association, to Sam or to the evangelicals or to somebody else. And that's one way the bishops won. And... The other thing is, a lot of these bishops have come away, I cannot say a lot, but the, I have heard third hand, sec, you know, <laughs> second hand. Right. Now you guys are hearing it third hand. Uh, second hand is that they're livid because this was, as the Church of the Evangelical Council said, a lose-lose. Mm -hmm. That, you know, nobody appreciates the hard work they did to prevent it from making it worse, is essentially what some people are saying. And, you know, I can't win either way. If I try to keep this institution going, if I try to keep the diocese afloat, I don't have any money. The church commissioners are spending it on reparations and whatever the hell else they want to do. I need money for clergy and buildings and this and that, and I'm not getting it. And I got to keep all these Joe balls juggling up in the air. And I'm getting grief from people who listen to George and Kevin for not, for my not being a martyr. Well, I'm not called to be a martyr. I'm called to be a bishop of the Church of England, which is a big difference. And I have sympathy for that point. I do. Yeah, I do. I mean, because they basically are stuck in a very difficult position. And the reason is because there's no leadership. Or Justin trust. Welby. This no could trust. have been his hour. Yeah. This could have been his hour. And it wasn't. Well, it could have been, I mean, it could have been his hour if he had, you know, done something years ago. I mean, he slowly, like any, like a plane crash is not one single event that happens. It's a cascade of many different events that finally ends up with a plane hitting terra firma. Justin Welbert has hit terra firma as in a plane crash here because of actions he took long ago by not stating and being firm and being honest with the people he's talking to. It's not, right now, Jane Ozan is just as mad as the conservatives by what has happened at last week's Senate. Nobody's happy. And most people, including Jane Ozan, probably think that they were lied to by not just the Archbishop of Canterbury, but many of the bishops there. And I can't oh. disagree. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, Jane Ozan and Peter Tatchell heard the Justin Welby tell them that he'll make sure and he's going to take names and crack down on clergy who are unkind to LGBTQ plus people. Well, that in Jane Ozan's mind means that she can decide what's being unkind and she can report it and she sees no action because she is so hypersensitive that any 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 slight is a, a grave insult that is a, is counted tantamount to a death threat you know when you give narcissistic people uh the the ability to define the crimes against them they're going to find a crime under every bush under every rock and then when welby doesn't act he's a liar because he didn't define his terms he just well, said yes yes whatever you want but when they had the meeting outside of lambeth uh uh, that one night they stormed the gates called uh, meeting. 24th, with, January 24th, Monday. January 24th. Uh, Justin Welby basically agreed to an inquisition. Can mm -hmm. we root out those people who are being disrespectful or trying to pray for the conversion of LGBTQ? And Welby said yes. And now begins the inquisition. If you're allowed to root out people who are faithful reading scriptures, who have faithful ministries, who have already... Uh, been able to pray for and lead people into conversion, not just for same sex, but for adultery, for greed, for you know my list of sins. Uh, you know, it's it, it's a sad world, George. It's a sad world. But at the same time, you know, do you remember the Monty Python skit? Uh, Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, um, <laughs> where the <laughs> oh, uh, goodness where Eric Idle comes on, dressed as a cardinal with a little pointy beard and a red uh, cassock and cape and hat. 
And the joke is about a continuing definitions of things. So they never actually get around to doing the exec exec ex uh, execution. Inqui inquisition. Yeah. Uh, nobody expects the Justin Welby Inquisition, and it's just as effective as the Spanish Inquisition on Monty Python. It's farcical uh, because Welby's unable to explain what the purpose of this of the Welby Inquisition is. He, he can't explain it to the satisfaction of the liberals. He can't explain it to the satisfaction of the conservatives. And now he winds up being accused of being two-faced. Well, clearly, Justin Welby has some explaining to do. He flies to Ghana for the ACC meeting and gives his presidential speech in with which he indicates that he may have been pressured by people in the government of the UK, British government, and says, I thought threatened. I thought maybe we would even lose disestablishment. I'm, I'm kind of embellishing here. But uh, uh, he indicated during his speech, first of all, that... Uh, he was influenced by uh, politicians, and that uh, that may be part of the problem here, George. This statement in his presidential address to the ACC caused a immediate blow up. Welby essentially said that he was pressured by MPs to adopt gay marriage on, with the implied threat of disestablishment with Welby coming out saying, well, I would accept disestablishment over being pushed around. Well, what's the problem? At General Synod, uh, Andrew Sellis, the Church of States Commissioner who represents the Church of England Parliament, gave a speech saying, Parliament has already devolved doctrine to Synod. It can't take it back without a major constitutional uh, battle and and neither the liberals or the conservatives or labor or anybody wants to devote the time in parliament to the church of england that it would take to fight this battle that's a major undertaking akin to brexit in the time of in the amount of laws and and the complications involved so first off it's not being entirely straightforward second welby said he was summoned to parliament Mulvey is already a member of Parliament. He's a member of the House of Lords. He's an active speaker in the House of Lords. And he spoke to other members of Parliament, uh, Ben Bradshaw, Chris Bryant, members of Parliament, members of the House of Commons, and they shared his view, their views on gay marriage and the need for the church to adopt their views, which is normal parliamentary procedure. People on both sides of the aisle speak and discuss outside of the chamber and in the different chambers, what their hopes and visions are for legislation, whatnot. And then third, on Twitter, uh, Chris Bryant, MP from Rhonda, and at one time a Church of England ordinand years ago, said the Archbishop of Canterbury is making this stuff up. This was a cordial, kind meeting where they expressed their views, and in no way, shape, or form was there any threat. So Justin Welby, meanwhile, is telling the African world, I am holding up the tent that is protecting us all, and I'm protecting you Africans because the British government wants to do all this to you. This is what they're hearing. Yeah, they, we're going to recolonize you. Yeah. yeah, and the reality is the opposite. Welby is for what's been pushing, that he's pushing. He just won't do it himself. Um, and so he has been called by Jane Ozan and by uh, Orthodox Anglicans a liar or words like he's not being entirely straightforward or he's being disingenuous, you know, though, uh, not words that can result in legal action. But his reputation as being sneaky and speaking to what people want to hear has just risen dramatically by the events of the past week on this point by itself. And just meanwhile, let me just pause for a second. The, many of the primates regard him as not being truthful, fully truthful, or being economical with the truth. The last straw for Uganda was the appointment of a gay dean of Canterbury. Uh, and Welby at the time said, well, I had nothing to do with that. That's by committee, this, that, and the other. Well. The rules are that a bishop sits on the committee to appoint his dean in the cathedral. 
and the bishop may object to any candidate. So the bishop has a veto power over individuals. He may not impose a candidate, but he can veto a candidate. Mm -hmm. So Welby is saying, I couldn't do anything about this, yet he had absolute veto power over the person who later became, who was appointed dean, a partnered gay man, which was not a surprise. So Welby, the Ugandans know this. They're not stupid. They don't release these statements, but without having their lawyers read these things in advance, they know Welby is not telling the full story on the Dean of Canterbury. And so, but it's just another one of their experiences in dealing with Justin. What they, t what he's told, what they tell him, what he tells them, they take with a grain of salt and they check it against reality. Well, he, and here's the new reality. If you look on Anglica.inc of the most read stories this week, it is a statement issued by the Archbishop of Uganda on February 10th. Uh, th that, and when I'm talking about most read, if we've had 90,000 readers in the last week, that, that's quite a bit of reads there. Next story is the one we're going to talk about. Welby proposes pulling Canterbury out of Anglican Instruments of Communion. And I'm, I, I read that first, and I read the article, I said, he butter. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's got to save face somehow. Yeah, if the Global South don't like you and GAFCON's going, oh my God, he didn't do it. Uh, and the next Lambeth is 10 years away. You better have something up your sleeve in order to save face for the Anglican Communion. And if all that happened in the Church of England last week allows for us to have the primates pick the first among equals okay fine you know it's 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 one of the redeemable things this speech was reported badly by the secular press in my opinion mm -hmm. because they focused on the parliamentary stuff but to be fair that's what it's of interest to their yeah. readers yes the secular you know their readers but you know, the Anglican Communion News Service press release was, I don't want to say a tissue of lies, but it basically omitted what the important from an Anglican perspective. Now, let's put this in context. Welby has just had a miserable week. He looks awful. Physically, he looks awful. He's tired. You see some of the pictures of him in Ghana. He does not look well. And Welby has a reputation that when he's tired and nervous and anxious, he gets petulant and vindictive so he writes uh, this speech. allegedly okay this, we, this allegedly. is stuff we've frequently heard oh gavin has shared stories of uh, welby's uh, <laughs> yeah. treatment of uh, altar servers and things like that people who turned to the wrong page of the prayer book yeah. for him but, th but this okay. isn't about that let's this get, is about yeah. let's get let's let's get about okay yeah. monday yesterday the global south primates 12 of them were going to meet to discuss Essentially, Monir and Nice's call that uh, that the Archbishop of Canterbury, that first among equals position, be elected the way the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, is elected. Mm -hmm. But instead of cardinals, the primates. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury would still be an English bishop, and but we would have a separate office to move that out of a position appointed by the British government, by the Crown. So this is going to talk this. Welby is giving this speech with full knowledge of this is going to happen the next day. His speech is, he will defend the autonomy of the Church of England from all outside influence and agitators. This is what he was talking about when he was talking about MPs pressing him. And then about conservative Anglican groups pressing him. He's not going to let anybody dictate. But then he said, and I will quote him, the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury the See of Canterbury is a historic one. The instruments much change with the times. Okay, he's teeing it up. I will not cling to place or, posi or position. I hold it very lightly. Welby has just said he will surrender that position. He holds it lightly. He is stepping back from exercising the authority on par with the Lambeth Conference or the Primates Meeting or the Anglican Consultative Council. He will step back in his person as the Archbishop of Canterbury as instrument of communion. 
But then that's the first half. Then the caveat, provided that other instruments communion choose the new shape. Now, he's saying if everybody else agrees who's a decision maker here, he'll do it. There are four decision makers, he's saying. Him, as Archbishop of Canterbury, yeah. the primates, Paris, yeah. the Lambeth Conference, and the Anglican Consultative Council. So there are so, four. He's already said he's willing to go. He's preempting the primates mm -hmm. who have said he's they, he should go. That just leaves the ACC and the Lambeth Conference. Now, the cynic could say, well, that, yeah. that uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kevin and I said, well, you know that, does he mean he's going to wait 10 years? Mm -hmm. Well, no, he'll probably have to poll the bishops of the communion. Mm -hmm. That means leaves the Anglican Consultative Council, where they'll have to call a special meeting with one issue on the agenda, and you better believe Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda will go, and there'll be a whip round ahead of time. Uh, and so, Kevin and I, you, you and I will be employed for years to come. I on wanted that, to, what this I looks did. like. <laughs> I wanted but, to retire soon, George. This isn't happening. Yeah, but Justin, in his words. Um, I'll continue reading. Provo that we are not dictated to by people, blackmailed, bribed to do what others want us to do, but that we act in good conscience before God, seeking a judge that is not for our power, but exists for the new world with its extraordinary and terrifying threats. To proclaim Christ and turn our opportunities and realities to bless the world, this is the test. We are in a true world crisis in which the global south, though economically poor, is in many ways richer in culture and community. We are not dictated to by people. What's this referred to? MPs, the global south primates. We're not blackmailed, which we know what that means. <laughs> We're not bribed to do what others want us to do. That means Trinity Wall Street and the Episcopal Church, and the various mission societies don't get the poor, docile provinces to do what they want where the money gets cut off. Mm -hmm. That's the way it has always been. I sat in a taxi with Ron Haynes, the Bishop of Washington, after the 98 Lambeth Conference, going to the airport. And Bishop Haynes just kept going on and on how ungrateful the Ugandans were. We had sent, we, Washington, had sent them all this money, and now they had betrayed us by voting for their conscience and dignity rather than voting the way we wanted them to, and we told them how to vote, and they didn't do it. No more of that, Welby says. So if we follow all of Welby's public guidelines, we're going to have a new way of doing things. Now, may, uh, may I just, I don't know, Kevin, if you want me to raise this now, but after this story came out, Lambeth Palace got on the phone. Or, no, I can't say that. Yeah, okay. Sources uh, we, close. We have, been, we have been contacted in a unofficial capacity by those who are there to help Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, in a professional capacity. And friends, if you remember the old Saturday Night Live, uh, this betrays our age, Kevin's and mine age, no, don't uh, do this. with the newsreaders, <laughs> where uh, Jane Curtin would give the news and then Dan Aykroyd would give the counterpoint. Essentially, the attitude taken by Lambeth Palace to what I had written was, George, you ignorant, oh, fill in the blank. Hit the buzzer, Kevin. Well, uh, but but now, in defense of them, their job is to keep what happened last week at Synod somewhat feasible and honest. And of course, it wasn't the end of the communion. Stop reporting it. Of course, it's not the end of the Church of England. Please stop reporting it. Of course, Justin Webb is not going to step down in, in disgrace or, or take the sword. They have to defend. That's their job. So it, when they send some emails questioning our coverage, I respect that. Yeah, yeah. They objected to some of the verbs I used: mm -hmm. surrendered and yeah. uh, descriptive terms. Pulled back. Sure. He hasn't surrendered. He hasn't pulled back. And I said, "Well, what does this mean?" And they said, "Well, read the whole thing." I said, "I have read the whole thing." And it turned out that we're looking at two different clauses. Correct. I will not cling to place or position. I hold mm -hmm. it very lightly. That's what I was focusing on. He, without being prompted, has surrendered. They say, wait, wait, wait. What's the second half say? That, that we are, that the other instruments choose the new shape. 
-hmm. he'll jump if he has the three others push him. Right. And so I read that. He's made the decision to jump. Right. I read that, and it tells me that Justin Welby will not respond to uh, just the primates asking him to step down. It it would take all instruments um, to do so in whatever form that takes. Um, My point is when the primates make a decision and you are in the minority, uh, you don't really have a choice because I don't know if our our viewers know this, the instruments of uh, unity are a figment of somebody's imagination. There was no democratic vote that these are going to be the instruments of unity. This is not written in any Anglican tradition anywhere. This is not the formula is found in the uh, 39 articles. It just popped up a couple years ago. Just popped up. 1997, the Virginia (laughs) Report suggested these four instruments of community. It was brought to the Lambeth Conference. The Lambeth Conference did not adopt the instruments Mm -hmm. of unity. And I think it was 2005, they changed the name to Instruments of Communion and just went on as if they were formal things. They're not. Mm. They never were created. Just like the Anglican Consultative Council's General Secretary was morphed into the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. Nobody gave that authority. They just printed new stationery at a certain time and assumed the authority and nobody except poor George had the institutional memory to say, hey, wait a second. When John L. Peterson did this under George Carey, Peterson was slapped down hard saying, because Carey said, wait, there is no Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. You're a Secretary General of one of the four instruments. Yes. You know, learn your place, boy. Well, that was allowed to, you know, bureaucracies expand unless you push them back. And uh, Walt Williams in his latter years, when he had essentially given up after the covenant blew up in him, and Welby, who never knew any better, allowed this bureaucracy to expand such that now we have the lawyers setting the doctrine of the Church of England in synod. We have the secretary general, which who isn't a secretary general, exercising, exercising authority of which he has no authority. So it's a mess. But my interpretation is that it doesn't really, I can understand the point made by those close to the Archbishop who are disappointed in my coverage. Their point is that there's a, that we think a process will unfold, that we're all going to walk together. I have the opinion that when you have a crack in the dike, it doesn't matter which way the cracks expand. (laughs) There's a hole. And it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the fact that there's now a hole means make, is the story. Not that we're agreed on how the hole will expand over what time and what place. I'm focusing on the existence of a hole. Yeah. And Justin yeah. Welby has created a hole, in my opinion. The Archbishop of Canterbury, from any perspective to the vows he took to be bishop, is in dereliction of duty. Um, has uh, violated those vo- vows and should be held up accountable by the primates, his equals. Uh, I don't find uh, the ACC to be his equal, so I'm not holding out hope for that. But, you know, this, now this is something we have to watch. George and I clearly are going to be employed for a long time, not employed, we're <laughs> doing the show for a long time, and we'll just have to see what happens here. Um, I want to kind of leave this kind of an ending here uh, because we'll be talking about this for months to come, especially after GAFCON, especially when the Global South release a press release sometime this week about their meeting. Um, it should be interesting to hear if they want to go back to the covenant way. Uh, could you imagine a covenant where um, there is a leadership of the primates, but the Church of England, Canada, and the Episcopal Church don't have voting rights at the primate level? I mean... Yeah. I think if, if I were to, well, this may be wishful thinking on my part, but I remember the letter Rowan Williams wrote to John L. Howe, uh, John W. Howe, the Bishop of Central diocese Florida. Diocese to diocese, yeah. Saying that it's the diocese is the central unit for administrative purposes, not the province. Mm-hmm. And the, prov- the covenant blew up on the having the provinces sign off. 
if they approach this by having dioceses sign off, you would have half a dozen Canadian dioceses, the Arctic, mm -hmm. uh, New Brunswick, absolutely, uh, 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 Fredericton, I think it's its name, but some dioceses sign up immediately. If you said to the said to Episcopal Church diocese, will you sign this? Uh, will you be part of this Anglican covenant? Central Florida, Dallas, Albany, mm -hmm. and others I think we'd be surprised about who are below the radar would sign up in a shot if they weren't threatened with immediate destruction by 815. <laughs> so, uh, and, but then in, uh, in, Niger in uh, Kenya, you'd have one or two dioceses that uh, would rather keep tightly to the spigot flown from New York instead of uh, going with their national leader. So it's not... So, it the wouldn't primates be universal. Represent no, I agree. Yeah. No, it would be universal in Nigeria, I think, mm -hmm. and in other places, and sure. it, um, but you know, and in Brazil, for the Anglican Episcopal Bra Brazil is a uniformly liberal diocese, but then the, we have the Anglican Church of Brazil, which would now be part of this new uh, Anglican entity, whatever we call this communion. Um, it's exciting times, Kevin, because. The sacrifice, it looks like the sacrifices made by those who formed the ACNA will not have been in vain in relation to the wider Anglican communion, nor will the sacrifice of those faithful Episcopalians who've stayed fast and fought in place be in vain if we're able to pry the dead hand of. Uh, David Booth Beers and uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey off the top levels of the church. So, but, and so here's here's the like general uh, the executive council just had a meeting, Episcopal Church leading thing, and they basically fought all week. They had to hire a new chief operating officer, and now a majority of people in the executive council are, as they like to call them, B I P O C, Black Indigenous People of Color. And there was a big stink because they hired a qualified white woman to be the new chief operating officer, and the black activists wanted to have a black person. Uh, I, would hope they would, I would hope they would go for a transgendered black person. I but let's you know, the, in other words, the the, the Church of England, the, the Executive Council, is be clowning itself on: Do we want competency or do we want race? Uh, yeah. Do we want a church that looks? Like, uh, well, I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we don't need to overdo what's obvious to the human eye. Um, but here we are. We're picking up the pieces from the Church of England uh, a week later. And that's just what's going to be happening for a long time now. As re Anglicanism now needs to recapture its identity. Refind out who it is. And we know the biggest problem within Anglicanism is the lack of accountability, the lack of to hold others accountable at the bishop level or the uh, the primate level or the province level. And I would hope that some margin that, that would be in a covenant or a future agreement of what Anglicanism is. I don't know if it's going to work that, that way or not, but that's an ongoing story that we've been, we exist solely to cover this type of news. However, there's a new new news story out there, George. And it's called Asbury. And, oh, go ahead. And it is my hope that this is the future of the Anglican Communion. Oh, sure. Oh, yep. Uh, we have to... We are being held back from spreading the gospel because we're tripping over ourselves. We're tripping over ourselves because we don't know our role within the church and our role as brothers and sisters in Christ in that church. We're just tripping over each other. Uh, we could... We could be serving and glorifying God at such a, a much better rate. On to Asbury Theological Seminary. No, college. Whatever. Asbury I, College. I hear there's a revival going on around. And when we, re, when we turn to something like this, we need to really frame this by definitions and understanding about what we've seen in the past and what we're going to see in the future. And I want to be honest here. There are, you know, uh, 5,000 uh, unofficial broken revivals for every one real revival. Maybe 10,000. Okay. But there are real revivals within the church. Here, we've seen it here in, in the West many times. 
Uh, I can think of you know some good revivals here. We've had it in almost every continent that I can think of, except Antarctica hasn't had a revival yet. And it's something that it's a tool that God uses. I, let's just be upfront with that. When we hear that there's a revival happening, what's the first thing we're supposed to do? I would say the first thing we're supposed to do is pray about it. Lord, if this is something you're doing, let us discern properly what our role is in it. Because we are Christians and we should certainly be taking part of any revival. The second role we have is to test it. Well, what tools do we have to test it? Well, thankfully, we have enough failed revivals that we can test it against that. And we have enough real revivals that we can test it against that. And we have scripture, which is, you know, the proving ground of all revivals, Old Testament and New. And we have reason and we have experience. So, George, tell me what you hear from this little Asbury Chapel thing going on. A little context. In 1970, at Asbury College, which is a Methodist college in Wilmer, Kentucky, middle of nowhere, it's about mm -hmm. 11, 12 hours northwest of Kevin and myself, uh, in 1970, a revival began in the church chap college chapel that lasted 10 days, 10 days, continuous prayer and worship day and night. It wasn't, struct it wasn't scripted, it was unstructured. And from that grew the charismatic renewal movement. And the, it had already existed, mm -hmm. but the revival of the 1970s, the Jesus movement began, its epicenter was uh, Asbury College. My parents were involved in the Crescio movement in the mid and early 70s, and I can remember the fervor in which they embraced their Episcopal worship and the renewal that was taking place, where Crescio and things like that church became, rather than a social function, a lived experience in communion with God and the communion of saints and your brothers and sisters in Christ, um, converted my parents. Then, of course, as these things happen, it all sort of died away. But now we're seeing we're into day five, as of our broadcast, of another revival breaking out at Wilmore in Wilmer, Kentucky. People are now traveling there, uh, young people from other colleges, some charlatans, some of these TV ministers are going there. Uh, and I hope they don't try to hijack this for their own benefits and purposes in, to exhibit wonders and powers and money raising feats. But in the United States, we had the Great Awakening in the uh, 19th oh, yeah. century. Yeah. yeah, And we had the Welsh revival of the late 19th, early 20th century. And we've had the East African revival. The East African revival in the 1930s is what makes the Church of Uganda, the Church of all those churches, so powerful. Mm -hmm. is the East African revival. And it wasn't an institutionally planned thing. It just broke out. And if it weren't 11, 12 hours, I'd get in the car, but I've got a job. <laughs> I can't, I can't well, take yeah, off the time. Yeah. And right now, Christians around the Southeast, you know, are, are uh, well, checking the map. So maybe I could go there, you know. And, uh, I have had some friends go there and attend it. I uh, actually posted a video on my Facebook page of a person who attended who has my perspective on it. Boy, if this is real, it's awesome. But we can't assume it's real and we can't assume it's false. We need to test it. And we need to pray for it because we've been praying for a revival in this nation for decades. And if you look around, it needs it. If any country needs a revival, uh, to to wash out the woke, to wash out the sin, to wash out the pride with and without the church, within the church. Um, it, it's America right now. The United States of America needs a revival because we've lost our focus on who we are and we lost our focus on glorifying God. So if this causes us to re-imagine that in any way, any way, I, you have no greater supporter than Kevin. I had experience where about 20 years ago uh, I went to a David Pitches who was a former bishop in Argentina or uh, Chile who went back to England and led a charismatic revival movement in England with his church and he came to Florida 
with the express purpose of beginning a revival in Florida. And that's been my devout hope ever since I've been a priest, is that people become alive to the spirit of the word of God. And I went to this, and I was so very disappointed because pitches I really liked, um, but it was the people who sort of flocked to these things, the charlatans, the uh, the Lord has told me sorts, who have, you know, particular worldviews and particular, you know, uh, this is, you know, this is the sign that we should now vote for Proposition 12. Yes. Um, sort of stuff. Uh -huh. So having been disappointed once, I don't want to be disappointed again. But this time it's not led by a name, a man who is renowned for these sorts of things. Rather, it's spontaneous arising led by students and young people. And no, there's nothing in Wilmer, Kentucky, but Asbury Seminary. So it's right, only but, old people, teachers, and kids, students. But the kids at that age are the most vulnerable. They could certainly be taken mm -hmm. over by the charlatans. And that's got to be your prayer. Father, keep these students, uh, you know, protected. Because the, to co-opt a student as as the Department of Education and most of these liberal colleges have shown is a piece of cake. There we have, we have no difficulty at all making your little conservatives into little commies, okay? And so the 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 young mind is very malleable. We need to pray for them, pray for their mm -hmm. protection, pray that in, in any of this that they turn to the Word of God and that they understand and are edified in this process through the word of god not through a preacher not through the hymns not through the songs the renewal music not through the charismatic experiences but truly just that that seed that we're given that ah, my rv has three or four of them you know bible yeah that's where we turn that's where we get the foundation of our knowledge of of being in the kingdom because you and i have this right fear because we have kids we've watched the, you know, how the society uh, can, you know, manipulate and malleate their, their minds, George. And not just kids, uh, people like me who want something so very much, sure. but revival is not due to anybody's effort. It's due to moving the spirit, history and scripture tells us. And perhaps, uh, um, What's sort of like the ministry course I'm going to be trained on. If you want to do this ministry, you really shouldn't do it <laughs> you're because right. you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. If you want to be a bishop, you really shouldn't be a bishop because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you want revival because you want a happy and successful church, that's not the right reason. Mm -hmm. It needs to be driven by the power of God. And I'm aware of those conflicts in my life. Yeah, and in as such, um, we have to be careful that this is not co-opted by social media, which it already has been. You know, which was you know the the first tweets, the first day, oh, service is still going, and then the, the tweets the next day, oh, this is yeah, they they were they were proposing this as a revival the very next morning, uh, and in the day of age of social media, it would be more easy to take a false revival and make it seem real. But it would also, in the age of social media, be able to take a real revival and make it seem like nothing. So, you know. Kevin, Kevin when I was in college, it was not unusual to have a party go to about 7, 8 the next oh morning. Uh, oh, my gosh. You know, because. <laughs> That's why I don't oh remember my. freshman year. You know, I understand. Yeah. It, you know? Uh, it, I mean, you just drag yourself to class the next day and, yeah, that was a revival of rum. You know, so. But in all, you know, if this is a great revival, we, we are we are humbled that it's happening in our generation. Um, if this isn't, we would ask that people could learn from this um, so that when it, it does properly arrive, we're ready. Because the scripture says, be ready. Be ready. A test. I mean, where do you think Ronald Reagan got test but verify from? Scripture. <laughs> so, ay, 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 ay. next story we got here. Oh, we're doing a combo story, George. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the, actually, there's a bit of prophecy here, Kevin, that okay. I just occurred to me. 
All right. Thinking about my college days, there was a German singer who was very prophetic. Nina. <laughs> she had this song called 99 <laughs> Luftballons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Nina, or that German pop star, all mm -hmm. those years ago predicted what was going to happen, where 99 balloons would go across the sky. Mm -hmm. And now we're living with that in the United States. It is, for whatever reason, um, it would be much safer for China to launch these balloons from Mexico and go over the southern border. Uh, there would be no questions asked. It would be much easier to get through immigration. Um, but we're doing it over the, the west coast. They could add some fentanyl for fentanyl, the pay for the cost of the trip. Um, but it, it's it's so ironic in this age of media what everybody just grasps onto as far as um, uh, following. The, we followed the first balloon all the way across. Uh, I was watching text updates. It's about me. It's about you know Myrtle Beach. It's here. Oh, they're shooting it down. You know, and so um, I don't know what to make of it. I do know it's most likely spy um technology from a, a country that does not like us but i do like tremendously that we're now adding extraterrestrial thought to this well maybe it's not china george maybe it's finally some aliens coming to see us on our planet oh boy <laughs> well i remember in night i was in college at the time 1982 the nicaraguans were building a 10,000 foot runway right. in the middle oh, of nowhere gosh. yeah remember that and uh, Ronald Reagan quietly told the, the uh, Russians, uh, if you put MiG fighter jets in there, because the only thing you need, it was the biggest runway in all of Central and South America. Yep. The only things that need that are, in, you know, military planes. Yep. He said, if I see, if we find one MiG on that runway, they won't be there the next day. So, and then the Russians the just quietly, or the runway, the Russians yeah. quietly abandoned building the runway outside of Managua. I think this is the Chinese version of a Managua airport. You know, how far can we test and push these guys? Uh, can we, you know, because anything that you can get from a balloon, you can get from a satellite. Um, I would um, imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're certainly not testing climate change. Okay, yeah, let, let, let's rule out the obvious. Um, and I would imagine yes and no. I, as far as what you can and can't do. Uh, are they testing America? At this point, any future balloons are testing the resolve of the Biden administration. Absolutely. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to see. Is it extraterrestrial? Um, extraterrestrial is a lot of fun, thinking about whether there's life other places. Uh, but when you start talking to top-level mathematicians, they will tell you it's absolutely impossible for life to exist in other places. And I, I'll probably, if I get a chance, I'll post the link to the video that just blew my mind about the math it would take for a, a, a germ or a person of our stature to exist in another world. Um, George, there's one more alien story. AOC questions whether or not somebody should spend millions of dollars putting a Super Bowl ad on halftime or Super Bowl about Jesus. And does he get it? The us? Archbishop of Canterbury? AOC. The Congressman. Oh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Ah. ah, yes. That, that the, the leading thinker of the 21st century Democratic Party mm -hmm. tells us that something tells me Jesus would not spend millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads to make fascism look benign. Now, this ad... Uh, he gets me is sort of a weak milk toast Christianity. You know, Jesus yeah. loves the poor, the lame, yeah. the sick, and Jesus would avoid political issues. Liberals can't stand any Jesus ad, and conservatives don't talk about. There's nothing about repentance. Well, uh, the well, stuff yeah. that, you know, well, the, it's not creedal, and uh, you know, if the desire is to keep Jesus in the national mind on football, you you did that. Um, but the, what I wanted to see happen was the theological question, does Jesus get us? And then, then nobody, nobody rose up to that from my, my, uh, Facebook feed. So, well, poor Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went from being the, the it girl of 1999, mm -hmm. 
uh, to being the eye roll girl of 2023. But how could anybody be so dumb? dumb or I don't, I don't, that's unkind. But yeah. I mean, to call milk toast Christianity benign fascism. Now, maybe she's talking about the Episcopal Church. I don't know. Is that mm. is that uh, where she's heading with that? I don't know. I I don't worry about her. I got uh, Church of England problems, George. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 789 of Anglican Unscripted.